Uh, good morning. Thanks to the organizers and sponsors for giving me this opportunity to talk about the role of Iraqi women and their challenge, needs, and what we did so far. But first, I will start with a question is in mind of all Iraqis, including Kurdish people, where we are from peace, that it's 13 years we all working to establish a sustainable peace in Iraq and all our international partners as well. Um, this question is in mind of all the Iraqis. A few years ago, four or five years ago, I was with a group of um, researchers. We did a study or research to find um, how the peace um, projects and interventions contributing to build a peace in Iraq. Unfortunately, the data we collected showed to us that we are working only on one approach within the um, four pillars of peace building strategy. It's like a table with half leg out of four legs. That's why we never approached peace in Iraq. On the contrary, June 2014, it was a dramatic uh, milestone for Iraqis when ISIS invaded one third of Iraq and still. Um, Focusing on role of Iraqi women and what we did so far, I will start with macro level. Iraqi women are victim of the violent extremism, even more than other groups. They are facing harassed, exposed to forced marriage, sexual slavery and slavery, rape, murder, threat, forced to abandon their religious and convert to Islam by ISIS or Daesh. Um, according to several reports by uh, local international UN agencies, um, there is um, the uh, uh, women, IDP women, they are in urgent need for health, education, legal, psychosocial supports. However, we have to share the contribution of our women grassroots um, to build the peace in Iraq, and we have many um, uh, interesting success stories of individual grassroots women who contributed to peace. We have many women in the rural areas of areas uh, controlled by ISIL. They uh, had an uh, important role on rescue life of many soldiers, Shia soldiers from the Iraqi military. Some of you who are interested to know about, uh, to, to hear about Iraq news, we have um, a spiker military base in Tikrit area. Thousands and thousands of Iraqi soldiers, Shia soldiers, have been killed by ISIL. We have stories of individual brave rural areas women. She could rescue life of many of those soldiers. Went through seven checkpoints of ISIL to rescue their life and take them back to the areas controlled by either Kurdistan region government or, or Iraqi government. But no one talked about those brave women. Media are neglected. And we don't have a, a peace journalist media who talk about those um, stories uh, who pro provoke for peace in Iraq, unfortunately. And even the international media, they're only focusing on the nar negative narratives that encourage for more conflict in Iraq. Women on the grassroots, we need to support them, to provide them and facilitate environment for dialogue, provide them with simple tools and skills so they can more contribute to peace and peace process in Iraq through community solidarity. We need to organize a formal platform so we can measure the impact of, of efforts of those individual women who contribute to building peace in Iraq informally. And also we have to focus on the individual resilience skills for those women, especially in this case of Iraq, that we have 3.2 million IDPs in Iraq. 52 of them, they are women and children, and they are suffering really from very bad condition. You can check IOM reports and other UN agencies report, UNHCR and UNDP. If I move to the MISO level, I have to share the good experience of the local NGOs, especially the women NGOs and the Iraqi Women Network. They work 
closely to, together and they could develop the National Action Plan of 1325. And they pushed the government of Iraq to be the first government in all the Arab region to sign for that. But unfortunately, there is no any action on implementing 1325. There is no any financial human resources allocated by the government to implement 1325, although it's more than one and a half year, the government approved National Action Plan. And also the emergency plan, which is um, developed after the June 2014, again by the Iraqi Women Network and a group of Iraqi um, in, uh, women NGOs. Again, the government approved, but with, without any action. Many of those um, women organization in center of Iraq and south of Iraq, they work on de-radicalization with the Shia militia, which is Al-Hajj al-Shaabi. This is the name in Arabic. We believe, and the women movement in Iraq, we believe that the militias are also have a very bad and negative impact on provoking violent conflict in Iraq. It's not only about ISIS or Daesh. Uh, we call for a one national army, an Iraqi national army that consists of all the ethnic religious groups in Iraq. This is what end and violent in Iraq. Uh, also, um, uh, Iraqi women NGOs, they, uh, sex, they, they have a, a success stories and also best practices in networking and platforms more than other um, uh, CSO or NGOs in Iraq because they believe that all women, uh, th their, their main vision is it's open to all the groups, ethnic, religious groups. They can be part of these networks because they, their aim is all its one. Their objective is all one, working for human and women rights. The Iraqi women um, uh, network mainly and the Iraqi women um, uh, movement in Iraq, they uh, recorded a lot of success stories in eliminating, eliminating gender-based violence and sexual gender-based violence. They were the one who imposed the quota in the Iraqi parliament. They proceed the domestic violence law in Kurdistan region government and also they pushed the government uh, to um, uh, consider Article 41 in the Iraqi Constitution, and the government agreed to uh, postpone this, working on this article because it's provoking for violence. Unfortunately, there is a lack of partnership principle between the civil society organization in Iraq and the government, and also um, the religion leaders and the tribe leaders, they, some of them, they have a negative role for driving the violent conflicts. That's why the voice of Iraqi um, uh, NGOs, women NGOs, is to urge the religious leaders and speakers during their Friday speech in the mosques to call for tolerance, culture of nonviolence, promote social cohesion, and also respect women's rights. When it comes to the macro level, Unfortunately, we don't have a proper um, um, uh, intervention by the government of Iraq and some of the international community. Only they are um, uh, working for the military intervention. But military intervention is not a solution for the current situation of Iraq. It can be an immediate intervention to um, stop the um, uh, ISIS or Daesh to extend to other parts of Iraq, but it's never the solution. The solution is to work in partnership with the government of, of Iraq, the, working with the civil society organization and the international community, including the UN agencies. They have to be the mean for building this culture of partnership. When we talk as a women movement with the government of Iraq, and of course, including Kurdistan region, about partnership, they think we want to replace the government. They don't have this culture of partnership and principle of partnership. Again, I will go to 1325 and how the international community can put a pressure on the government to, uh, have, to implement the 1325, because without cooperation and collaboration of the Iraqi government, we cannot move forward. Uh, the structural violence is a big issue in Iraq. We have um, within the Iraqi constitution, regulations, and law, a structural violence. I will highlight one of these issues, which is very relevant, relevant to our topic, is about illegal marriage. Illegal marriage of Iraqi women from Al-Qaeda and Daesh members. Some of it, it comes voluntarily by women who, because Al-Qaeda is in Iraq since 2003, especially in, in uh, Ambar area. 
Um, and also, some of them, they forced to get married to those Al-Qaeda member and now to Daesh member. S uh, since 2003, now is 13 years, they have thousands of illegal children with no um, uh, state, uh, they're illegal. They, they don't have a legal status in Iraq. So what's, what, what's your expectation? Those children will be recruited easily with, with those terrorist group, if it was Al-Qaeda, now Daesh, and tomorrow another um, of these groups will, be, will recruit them. Also for female women, um, uh, there is a trafficking, there is um, many issues, many problems that they will be involved and recruited very easily. Uh, prostitution is a big issue in Iraq. No one talking about these internal issues. Um, social cohesion in Iraq is being destroyed after, I mean, there, there were many reasons, but after the sexual violence the, um, um, and, and what happened in Iraq after June 2014, and there, there should be a punishment uh, on the international level and accounted as a crime against humanity and human and women rights. But unfortunately, so far, nothing has been done on, on this issue. Uh, and we encourage to incur in integrate gender equality and women empowerment to be a cross-cutting theme to many topics like economic, sustainable development, democratic uh, governance, crisis prevention and recovery without integrating gender um, uh, equality or to do all these aspects, then we cannot achieve any change. We cannot have a woman, Iraqi woman, participate in the reconciliation process, participate in a transitional justice in Iraq without um, empowering women. Always when we see, I mean, actually the transitional justice or let us say national reconciliation in Iraq never started in a proper and professional way. And um, there, there, there are some, let us say, initiatives, but men, let, let us say majority are men, if not, if not say all of them, they are men in this process. And when you argue them and ask them why women, she, she is not part of this, they excuse it that women, they don't have education in a field of peace or conflict, and um, also they don't have experience. But I would say it's not me women who have no education and professional experience. It's both, actually. We have, we, c we can say in Iraq, two or three, we have three people have academic um, degree in, in a field of conflict and, and peace. Two of them are women and one man. So this is not a justification. It's only to put pressure on the policy and the decision of the Iraqi government to push them, to put a pressure on them, to encourage women to be part of it. We see on the grassroots level, women are more active to contribute to peace, not men. Women have uh, many initiatives, but unfortunately, it's not covered. We don't have an independent media in Iraq. Media are co um, um, uh, affiliated by the political parties. There is no uh, a real media, and media is one of the pillars if you want to, ha to build a democracy in any country. Um, thank you very much, and maybe more clar clarification will come out when I have any concern and question from, from you all. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, having moved from the field of psychology where women are represented at all levels, particularly in the top decision making, to the security sector where I often found myself as the only woman in the group, yet we were making decisions that affected the whole population, 50% of whom were women. It sort of opened my eyes um, to the issues on ground. So while my paper is very general, it also really represents my own personal experience. Perhaps it is fair to say that our world has never looked more confusing. While the gaps between our generation and that of our parents have been modest, the gap between us and our children have never been starker. Children born in a technological age and living in a time of unprecedented global prosperity are exposed to the world in a way that we could not have imagined. As beneficiaries of historical struggles to make the world more equal, including the various fights for equality, the lines between girls and boys are far less blurred for them. Modern day terrorists with their team and youth populations have a far clearer understanding of their own generation. They are imaginative and flexible and have continued to define and evolve 
the role that women can play within their organizations. While it is true that many women were initially only allowed to play auxiliary roles, such as cooking, producing the next generation of so-called jihadis, they have since evolved to carrying weapons and assembling IEDs to fully-fledged combat roles, even within groups such as Boko Haram. The message to women then becomes one of choice. Whatever your inclination, there is a role for you in our movement. This then broadens their recruitment base. Girls who have romantic desires of becoming jihadi brides, as well as those who are driven by more idealistic notions of being involved in active combat, all have a place. In the last few years, Islamic terrorist groups are aligning and sharing values, strategies, and messages. And while countering or preventing violent extremism remains high on the policy agenda of governments and institutions globally, our response has remained hesitant and often uncoordinated, especially when it comes to the roles that women can play. Women are rarely at the table during the most critical aspects of military operations to provide an alternative lens. While we know that women have different perspectives, different networks, different lines of influence, and perceive and react differently to actions that impact on security, culture, finance, trafficking, cybercrime, they still remain underrepresented in the rooms where decisions are made. A true understanding of where women sit, both locally and globally, on the PVCV agenda requires some reflection on what I call the PVCVE pyramid. At the very top are governments and global bodies who are the primary decision makers. Most are men. I can talk from experience. Uh, a lot come in from a counterterrorism or security perspective. This effectively shuts the door for women from contributing meaningfully at the policy level. It also inadvertently allows the securitization of the problem, which then becomes viewed primarily through a national security prism. Uh, I've been to lots of meetings where people say, you can't talk about that, that's national security, and it's actually not anything that we can't talk about but because it's viewed through that prism. A dominance of male voices at the top table often misses the gender-specific dimension of violent extremism. Until recently, most PBECV efforts were targeted at men and boys. Yet we know that women and girls are not a cohesive group, but play multiple roles that include victim, perpetrators, enablers, as well as forces for good. In fact, I'm often sometimes more scared of the women of Boko Haram than the men of Boko Haram. At the middle of the pyramid are our community elders and religious leaders who hold the key to many PV interventions, including early warning response systems and messaging. Yet in many voices, they represent predominantly male voices where women voices are simply drowned. An example of this is that two years ago, I called a meeting of uh, the leading Islamic figures in Nigeria. Uh, this is a meeting that I convened, invited everybody, yet I was made to sit at the back of the room in my own meeting. <laughs> so, um, after this experience, um, we got together with one of the leading female um, Muslim leaders and decided that we had to do something about it. So we spent a year gaining the trust of civil society, which led us to form the first uh, civil society security sector network called PAVE, People Against Violent Extremism. A large number of the NGOs were led by women and religious leaders. This allowed us to have a broader understanding of the issues on ground, because there was not such a body that was advising and informing government at the highest uh, levels in national security. It also led us to design a PVE-based curriculum for Muslim clerics, a third of whom were women. Um, a lot of the voices in the community in terms of uh, Islamic uh, response to terrorism or messaging is led by men. Uh, even though we have a body of Muslim clerics, they're not empowered enough to have the platforms that they need. So this is what we tried to do. However, these remain isolated occurrences, for at the very bottom of the pyramid, one of the most important partners in the fight against violent extremism, women sit. Despite being on the receiving end of a large majority of terrorism actions that have included sexual violence as well as harsh state responses that often clamp, clamp down on their human rights, uh, women have been playing a frontline role in combating violent extremism, especially in Nigeria. These have included assisting the victims of terror. They're often the very first people to, to give succor to victims 
to negotiating ceasefires. Actually, Boko Haram agreed to come to the negotiating table on three occasions that I'm aware of. And on one of those occasions, it was because a woman was very instrumental, a barrister who had connections with the group, who really was the one who was able to bring them to the table despite all the efforts of government. Uh, the preventive efforts of women organizations are believed to have special advantages when it comes to building resilience at the community level, which we have seen when we've worked with women and mothers at the very uh, local um, uh, levels. They are often seen as non-polarizing and have been instrumental in many community policing approaches. Sadly, the power of women in this area to date remains untapped. Although they remain key factors in building resilience in their communities, women's groups struggle to get funding, both locally and internationally, to scale up their work. We've seen it even with the GSERF funding mechanism, where a lot of the women NGO groups that we have worked with have struggled to even uh, meet the requirements to access that funding. Um, they often have poorer skills and uh, the abilities to be heard meaningfully at levels where their voices should count. Secondly, a lot of reports that are commissioned and uh, uh, globally uh, that could have a lot of lessons for women's groups rarely ever trickle down to them. Uh, we know that we've had to make available a lot of reports to these women because they just didn't know how to access it when they're back in their local communities. For women to have a chance of full participation in preventing or countering violent extremism, national security architectures must change. Uh, security sector reform must include greater gender awareness, as well as the recruitment and retention of women in senior positions. Uh, I have left um, my position in government, and that position was replaced by a male. And for the three years that I worked there, I was the only woman in that office. Placing women at the center of our efforts to deal with extremism will help flatten the pyramid to a more square response that is holistic. Uh, we talk a lot about holistic approaches, but when we talk about holistic, we normally mean connecting the gaps between um, probably research, private sector, government. We rarely ever think about holistic in terms of women's place in the movement and women's representations at all levels of the pyramid. As the field of PBEC, PBE CVE moves from a militaristic approach to a more community focused response, now is the time to examine the emerging PCVE architecture and women's place within it. The, place, the space for terrorists to flourish will be squeezed if we truly incorporate a whole of society approach, both men and women as equals, not just internationally, nationally, but locally in our response. While terrorists have a greater understanding that by coming together, they strengthen their cause, our response must also be bold and robust. It must have at, as its center an international framework that has a greater understanding of the important role that women can play at all levels. Thank you for listening. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning. So I'll start similar to most people by sharing my journey, but I'll say it differently. When I first received the agenda, the first thing I did is look at where we were placed in terms of discussing issues re related to gender and women specifically. So I must say thank you for placing us on the second day uh, and uh, immediately after the coffee session, because in most instances you find the discussion around gender used to be placed on the very last day uh, and when people are really thinking about catching their flights. So now it's good that we've made progress, we are on the second day, and then uh, quite frankly, it was also good to have that gender section bit within the first day. Uh, as uh, Rana has mentioned, I work with the women in international security, but I also chair Sisters Without Borders. Uh, so my focus today would be looking at what we have done through the network Sisters Without Borders. Um, so I'll focus on why gender and why women and how women organizations and networks have played a role and what are some of the lessons we've learned. So gender to me is a very important aspect. For us to actually have an effect on PVE or CVE, we really need to look at things from a gender lens. 
And I have to urge that we really need to have greater attention on the identities and roles and relationships between men and women within societies and within the social groups, uh, the social movements, uh, and how the extremists are also using these roles uh, and uh, responsibilities amongst women uh, and men. What we've come to see, and I think this was even raised yesterday, is when it comes to the issue of gender, it, it, it's also used in their narratives. It's also used in the way they punish within those groups. Uh, a good example is when a woman is b included within those uh, social movements, you'll find they're being told, you, you have to be a good wife, you have to be subservient to your men. And then when it comes to punishment, it's almost like th they actually did a wrong thing and so therefore they have to be punished. It's, it's almost like they're being uh, applauded for being punished. Uh, and this is critical even in the way we look at our solutions or coming up with the programming around uh, working with women men in particular, is to go back and look at the actions and look at the ideology elements and, and look at that from a gender lens. So when we talk about PVE, in most cases you find we look at it from young men and young men, how they are joining. And then when you look at it from a point of women, the first thing they say is, oh, women are victims. Or oh, women are mothers of extremists. And in most cases, you find that is not completely uh, up, uh, un unpackaged for us to better understand the roles and responsibilities they play within those uh, within those movements, and at the same time look at how they have now evolved over time, depending on the fact that their roles are not static. Because similar to any transitioning country, the gender roles are, uh, are never static. And it's the same when it comes to these social movements. It's never static. We are seeing more women involved uh, at the front lines. Uh, to me, this is not shocking because we've always known that extremists use women for purposes of shocking and awing. Because we've always had this assumption that women are the, the child bearers. They bring people into the world. So how can they take away uh, people from the world? So they have tapped into that and, uh, and are aware that uh, using women can shock people and, and create more support for them. Uh, and when it comes to working with women, it's still there's still very little funding. There's still very little support going to women and women organizations who are working on the front lines. Uh, and I think it's very important to start looking at how we can support these women. Uh, in particular, I know yesterday we were talking about how much goes into security and the very little that goes into peace building. If you go deeper and ask how, may, how much of this actually goes into working, uh, supporting women groups, it's even much less. So we start looking at how we can in particular support uh, women organizations and not only in financing but also looking at improving their capacity for them to even access some of the financing that is available. So the reason why we formed the network uh, is because every time in Kenya we, we were engaging on issues of PVE, I would find I'm either the only woman there or we are going there with one of the national uh, uh, gender commission members. And it was always interesting because you find the majority being in the room as suits. And so the discussion around gender is you're just perceived as oh, there's another gender activist who is coming to talk about gender issues. So I've taken up the label that I'm a gender enthusiast instead. Of, so that to sort of open that dialogue for people to start engaging on issues of women in particular. So we formed the network because we also realized that we play different roles and we undertake different activities around people. PVE so we can strengthen each other and learn from each other by coming together. And this has also supported us to increase uh, our, our knowledge base on the ground because we are able to tap into some communities that maybe we were not able to tap into as one organization. So we are now able to expand that group and learn uh, quite a bit from the network. Uh, what I have to say is when we go on the ground and we're working with women organizations, one of the key things we keep noticing is when we are entering the community, uh, when a woman is entering the community, there's that perception that they are non-polarized, so the community sort of opens up to them because there's still the perception this is a mother, so she's trying to support the community to identify the grievances and, ad uh, uh, and advise around issues of you know building that community. So we're always seen as and polarizing. So we have a, a, a better way of even reaching some of the 
uh, factions that might not be reached. Uh, so some of the dialogues we've been having is on the security space and mostly on the policies. Uh, for instance, now Kenya is going through uh, the development of the national counter radicalization strategy, and we are pushing for that to have better roles of how women can be engaged at the national level on in issues of prevention. The other aspect that we managed to actually put across is before the national strategy, because this had taken and is still taking time to be developed. Uh, we saw the need of having uh, a unifying uh, strategy on board. And so we developed the National Charter on uh, Prevention, Accountability, and Advocacy, which brings together different civil society organizations to better coordinate and to have a better voice when it comes to issues of PVE, CVE, and the lawmaking process uh, related to the same. Uh, and this has really had quite a good momentum, and it has actually speeded up the process of the national counter radicalization strategy. Uh, we also engage through community policing initiatives. I know yesterday there was a discussion to say we really need to still work with security actors, and we do so through the community policing initiative. The trust between the community and the police is very, very low. So we look at mechanisms on how to improve that trust. But we do this by and still have to ensure, and it's a biggest challenge, that we don't instrumentalize some of the people we work with so that they are deemed as informers or uh, as seen as you know completely uh, providing information to the government actors. But we open up that space to start having dialogues on how we can improve some of the community policing processes. A good example is when we were discussing community policing and we went into the community, when the forms that go around each home for people to, to include who is the head of the household, the women asked, why is it we only have to write the men's name? You know, we are the ones who are in this household for the longest time. In fact, one example which always makes me smile is one lady stood up and asked, when you come home as a man, you go in, you sit at the table, you're served with the food, you eat and you go and sleep. Do you know who is in all the other rooms? And for the woman, she said, for me, I make sure I know who is in all the other rooms. So I'm the security expert in the household, but I'm not included in discussions around community police, including uh, in filling my name on those forms. <laughs> so we are an important part of this conversation. And, and that resonated to even the change of those documentation that we feel when it comes to community policing on the ground. The other thing we tap into is within the women groups, they have what we call table banking. In some countries, they call it the merry-go-round where communities uh, or women uh, take like 20 or 30 dollars from their kitty and sort of uh, uh, spread it around like they give it to one person and uh, everyone puts in money and then eventually at the end of the of the circle someone takes the money and they use that money for uh, economic support within the household so we tapped into that network and said this is a good opportunity to create awareness around issues to do with prevention and it has been very successful because we are going into their social networks which is done very rarely going into the social networks and sort of uh, engaging them as they are doing their economic uh, activities uh, one of the other key things we realized is we do not have especially in the Horn of Africa, a lot of female ulamas, people who are there, who female ulamas who can provide the religious literacy. So we, we have now formed a, a group that actually trains more women on uh, and provides religious education to them. On the issue of road models, uh, one of the key things we realized is when we met most of the girls who are uh, attempting to go and join Al-Shabaab traveling to Somalia, one of the narratives that they said was, my mother or my father keeps asking me, I need to get a pious man, and I make sure, uh, have to also make sure this person is someone who is economically endowed. How am I supposed to do that? You know, I, I need a religious man, but I also have to fit other parameters on the same. And I have found it through uh, the migration to Somalia. And we brought the girls uh, in the same room with the mothers, and we, we started having that conversation so that to break the barriers because there is still a gap between the young girl and the mothers. There is always that feeling they are not listening to us. And the mother is also saying, this, the, my children are not listening to me. So we bring them together and we have the conversation together with a psychologist so that they can open up that dialogue and, have, and start breaking the barriers that they have created as well. And then uh, on 
We also do support groups for women, uh, uh, especially mothers whose children or spouses have joined extremist groups. Uh, so what are some of the challenges we have? Trust building among stakeholders, and I'll, I'll go very quickly on this. Um, as I mentioned, when it comes to law enforcement, the trust is very low. There's fear of who you're engaging with. And this fear comes from, it, it's not only engaging in terms of who are the security actors in the room, but there's also fear around who else is in the room, who, uh, who could be a radicalizer, or who someone extreme within the, uh, violently extreme within the group that could end up attacking the women or uh, other participants within the same space. Of course, there's the issue of re reintegration. We, we still don't have a policy on this, and this is something that is still in discussion, and I mentioned this uh, yesterday within the Africa group. Our, the amnesty for Kenya was given through our local dailies. It was actually half a page. And we're still asking, where is, the, is it legally binding? What happens? Uh, it, it was not even uh, nationally gazetted. And this, I think, is also similar in Somalia. We need the, uh, the legal aspect when it comes to amnesty. Of course, there's the challenge of lacking confidence to speak up because there's always that fear of being investigated. Their son or their husband might have traveled, and they may have not given their consent for that, but there's still that fear of speaking up because they fear that they will be arrested or uh, investigated as, uh, as supporters. Uh, and of course, what I will not repeat what Fatima has said, but it's it's very true. We still need many w more women at the table to discuss issues of peace building and security. Uh, the key lesson is we do have the space to dialogue. We just have to utilize the space we have, uh, and it's always important to build capacity around community policing to go in line with how we do uh, CVE work. Uh, I also will quickly touch on the social programs. I know extremists use a lot of social programs. I was even giving the example of Al-Adi yesterday. But on, uh, it's also a good way for us to utilize some of these social programs to also break down barriers between uh, security actors and communities. So football marches, uh, art shows, etc. And one of the key things I should mention, social programs also bring in the private sector which we need to bring into the fold of CVE. One of our members is a Rotarian, a Rotary Club member, and was able to solicit for financing from the Rotarians, and we painted a police station. So it becomes a key entry point to bring in even other actors. Uh, I mentioned the issue of ulamas, and of course there's need to, to do the knowledge sharing and across the board. So what is the final conclusion? I only have one minute left. Uh, I think it's important for us to stop looking at uh, the auxiliary, auxiliary positioning of the role of women, uh, whether they're the problems or the solutions. We need to start looking a little bit deeper from just uh, branding them as victims and mothers of extremist groups. Secondly, when it comes to state actors, for us, I think one of the key things people have to remember, women organizations are part of those communities. When we're looking at civil society organizations, we have to ensure that we're also looking at the women organizations. Sometimes we are left out. So we are part of that, and we really need to be put on the table to have those conversations. And when it comes to development partners, the gender lens matters. How do you do the do no harm principle if you're leaving out half of the community and half of the population from these discussions? You need to bring the women on board you need to find ways to ensure that you're even building their capacity so that they are almost at the same level with other organizations. And finally, for women, your voice counts, so please speak. You don't have to speak up, but you just have to speak. Thank you.